Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I know how concerned we all are that the holidays are coming, and we don't want to eat too much, but we want to have a lot of that wonderful food. We don't want to overindulge. We don't want to ruin our figures, ruin our health, just to celebrate the holidays. So that's why today I've got this terrific guest, Ellie Krieger, a host of the Cooking Channel Show. And you are so popular. We have so many questions for you. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we really want to know the answers to these questions because we want to get through the holidays, you know, without feeling sick. I always feel sick after Thanksgiving I dinner. Know. You were telling I me know. that should not be. I know. Well, I just can't help it. I eat everything. <laughs> I know. And all year I watch myself, but at the holidays. Well, one day, it's fine to overdo yeah. one day of the year. Right. But you can really enjoy yourself and have it all without feeling sick after. Okay, well, you're going to tell us. You're going to tell us how to do that. We have so many questions. The first one is from Harriet, and this is a really good question. She says, for Thanksgiving dinner, what are the dishes I can prepare and freeze ahead of time so that I'm not making everything the day of? Right, managing that big crowd of people coming to your home. I mean, that can be pretty overwhelming. Right. Well, Harriet, luckily, there are so many dishes. You can really prepare most of your Thanksgiving dishes in advance. So all of the breads, cornbreads, muffins, things like that, Freeze Pie. really well. Pie, I wouldn't say freezes really well, no. so I'd wait for that. But you can make it the day before, can't you? It's the day before, yeah. yeah. But you can make you can make breads like cornbreads and muffins a week or more oh, before really? and freeze them, and they freeze really well and they just thaw them Great. the day before or the mm -hmm. day morning of. Right. Also, soups. So if you're going to do a nice pumpkin soup, which is also can be really right. healthy, yeah. soups freeze really well. So you can do that weeks ahead. Then the day before, yes, you can do pies. Right. You can do any kind of casserole, really, mm -hmm. the day before or even two days before. Right. So I would say get most of it done ahead of time so that you can relax and enjoy yeah. yourself on the day as well. And be there with the family. Exactly. Here's a good question. I wonder if you know the answer to this. Michelle wants to know if there are any foods that are aphrodisiacs. Michelle, <laughs> I like how you think. <laughs> you know what I really think, Marlo? I think that if you're eating a meal with someone that you love, that is an aphrodisiac uh -huh. in itself. Yes. So that or oysters, said, right? Yes, oysters. oysters. Well, because, well, whether they're officially, you know, <laughs> chemically aphrodisiacs, I don't know. But I think foods that you eat with your fingers, it becomes more sensuous of an experience. Right, right. And that can trigger, you know, aphrodisiac uh -huh. life. You mean fried chicken? <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but maybe you feed each other shrimp cocktail right. or something or yeah. oysters, absolutely. But actually chocolate has um, a chemical effect on our body that actually gives us the feeling of being in love. Oh, really? So, yes. So mm. maybe start with some oysters, go to some shrimp, feed each other, and then end with a nice fondue or something. What's better than <laughs> oysters and chocolate, for God's sake? Exactly. <laughs> this is from Brianna. She says that you say you can make mac and cheese healthy. Is that possible? Is that possible? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I have a couple of really great macaroni well, Tell and us a little recipes. secret about that. Okay, first of all, just healthy is not cutting it for me. Right. It needs to be delicious right. and healthy. So it really has to hit the spot. It can't be some sub par mac and cheese because no, right. I'm a food lover here. So what kind of mac okay. and what so kind what of I cheese? Okay, so what I do is, so first of all, you know where you to use the flavor. So use the, use the flavor, it comes from the cheese. Re use real cheese. Key to use real cheese, but you can really lighten it up by using milk that's thickened with a little flour instead of cream mm -hmm. in the sauce. So uh -huh. I use milk, low-fat milk, thickened with a little flour, and then here's a great trick. I take butternut squash, pureed frozen butternut squash or winter squash and fold it in so that you're actually incorporating a vegetable. You're getting this Ooh, great orange color. Good. You get your real cheese that sounds delicious. and you fold that in and that's just one of my ways that I fixed it. Another way I fixed it is I've chopped up cauliflower really fine to mimic the shape of the pasta. So I use pasta, but I use a little bit less, uh -huh. and I fold in the cauliflower. Oh. And who doesn't love cauliflower with no, cheese sauce that's as well? Great. So. That's a great idea. <laughs> this is from Stacy. I could really use some ideas for high protein, low calorie, low fat dishes that don't take forever to mix, to fix, and don't involve expensive, hard to find ingredients if such fruits, foods exist, lol. <laughs> <laughs> I find it funny, Stacy, that you think these foods don't exist because there's Dozens and dozens of things of recipes like this. Really? I can't even tell you. And this is, I have three things to think about. Okay. So, you know, bi life's busy. Who has time? I'm also a busy mom making right. dinner. I want right. it to be healthy. I want it to be high in protein, high, you know, lots of vegetables. Pick a, a quick cooking protein. So shrimp, chicken, you can use beans. Canned beans are great. Um, pork tenderloin, lean beef, mm -hmm. quick cooking protein. 
a vegetable that you don't have to do so much chopping to. So cherry tomatoes, pre-washed arugula, pre-washed mm -hmm. um, uh, spinach, frozen peas, things like this. Keep these on hand and quick cooking whole grains. So quinoa, mm -hmm. um, pr um, quick cooking brown rice, mm -hmm. also whole grain pasta. So you have these key ingredients. You can mix and match in ways right. that are fast and healthy. You're going to have a great amount of protein, whole grains, and be you know low in calories. And none of those ingredients are hard to find. No, That's all, all right easy there. stuff. Right. It's all right there. This is from Kat. This I really like this question. Do you have any inflammatory foods and menu ideas? Right, so anti-inflammatory, because yeah. we're not, we want to be anti-inflammatory, right? right? <laughs> That's yeah. really interesting, because we hear so much about the, the inflammation in our bodies. Exactly, and inflammation is thought to be the root of just about every disease. Certainly heart disease. Yes, and also premature aging, you know, mm -hmm. signs of aging um, is linked with inflammation as well. Right. So absolutely important. And one of the key foods is salmon or, or fish, because uh -huh. the fat that's in fish is anti-inflammatory, those right. omega-3 fats. So those are also in a lot of different nuts and seeds. Mm -hmm. So one recipe that I love is just to take, and also anti-inflammatory, um, cumin, coriander, uh, turmeric, so th all the spices, oh, they're right. in curry. Right, all the so, Indian spices. Exactly, so salmon, um, deep green and orange vegetables, all, all the foods with I curry in them. Have, I wonder if they have less heart problems in I don't in know, India. it would be interesting to yeah. track. But you can do a lovely salmon dish uh -huh. with a little bit of curry powder, mm -hmm. serve that with some kale or spinach, and that's an anti-inflammatory anti meal. In my book, Comfort Food Fix, I have a wonderful autumn vegetable curry with lots of orange and green vegetables, with chickpeas, also in a beautiful Great. curry sauce. Oh, so. that sounds delicious. Did you bring your book? Oh, I don't have it with What's me. What's your book called? Silly. So I have a lot of books, but my latest cookbook is Comfort Food Fix. Oh, that sounds great. And I just came out with a revised edition of um, my very first book, which is called Small Changes, Big Results. Oh, that's great. We'll so. get them. We'll get them. <laughs> well, look, Ginny wants to know, what's your favorite fall comfort food? Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, I'm <laughs> such a food lover. It's hard to pick, but I love soup. Yeah. Do you love soup? I do. Love it. I mean, I feel like there's nothing... Lentil soup. I love bean soup. Oh, Lentil yeah. Lentil soup and bean soup and barley soup. I love those soups. I completely agree. And you know what? They can really be... They are so healthy. Yeah, they are. And you don't have to prepare them with a lot of fat. I think mm -hmm. just staying away from soups that have a cream base. Right. But you can even make a creamy soup by pureeing it mm -hmm. in the blender. So you can take, um, you know, like butternut squash or pumpkin um, and make it... In, cook it with some onion and then puree it and you get that creaminess because you're getting the creaminess right. from the vegetable. That's great. Uh-oh, uh this, is, this is a biggie. Erica, hello Erica. She wants to know what's the average amount of calories on a Thanksgiving plate? A lot. And, and are there any <laughs> tips to lessen it? You said before that you thought it was around 4,000? I think it's upwards of 4,000. Oh my gosh. It, it's a lot. I mean, an average person, putting that in perspective, average person needs like 2,000 a day. Oh my God. Uh, maybe a woman needs more like 1,800. Oh, wow. So this is... It's about two and a half days a lot. worth. It's a lot of calories. You've already had breakfast. <laughs> and, yeah, and the point is, is that you can enjoy your Thanksgiving without right. overindulging like that because you do wind up feeling sick yeah. and that's not fun. Well, what are some tips to lessen that? So one of the things is to fill your plate mostly with the vegetable. And if you're in charge of cooking, or even if you're bringing right. something, bring a vegetable right. that's not dripping with cream sauce. Right, right, right. Besides, one of the things that I think is really key to balance the meal, just from a culinary perspective, is to have something bright and crisp on the plate. Right. Not everything needs to be so yeah. rich. Right, right. So first of all, um, don't eat too many hors d'oeuvres, because I think we, we come to the yeah, table starving. I don't starving. do that on my Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, I don't we, have hors d'oeuvres. I just have some, that's some smart. carrots and vegetables out. Because it's a problem. We yeah. come to the table starving. By the time we get to dinner, we're already right. halfway under, right. you yeah, know? Right. <laughs> Not to mention the drinks. So, um, so, so kind of skip or go easy on the hors d'oeuvres. Right. Or make a plate and just take what's on that plate for right. the hors d'oeuvres, then move on, and then wait for the meal. At the meal, fill your plate with mostly the vegetable, mm -hmm. and then take a little bit of each thing, that's right. fine. Push away, don't have seconds. Oh. Um, and then save a little and room for dessert. don't have both pies. Or you know what One I think pie. is a great tip? Take a break. So instead of saying, I'm stopping, say, you know what, I'm just gonna take a break. Right. And literally push back, and it's amazing what a trick that plays in your mind. Because yeah. once you take a break, you suddenly realize after what 10 minutes. Eating, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's an orgy of food, it, it really, really is. is. And taking a break can really help oh, you make the right decision. That, now see, that's a great tip, I like that. 
Oh, this is from Carol. What's a favorite fast and healthy breakfast idea? Well, I, I love smoothies. I'm a really... I'm a protein drinker. You are? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I love just... I make smoothies just... I always keep frozen bananas in my uh, freezer right. and then I throw a banana in the blender with some milk or some yo and or some yogurt and a scoop of almond butter or peanut butter and I just blend that up. No, it, uh, but aren't bananas fattening? Okay, so bananas, anything if you eat too much of it right. of course is fattening. But, I mean, I but a banana has what, 100 calories? So in the end the smoothie itself would have about 300 right. calories and that's perfectly appropriate. That's good. That's good. So yes, if you eat a bunch of bananas right. or if you eat, if you think it's a free food and you just like <laughs> So yeah, they're not. They're a very, very healthful food, and they have lots of B vitamins and potassium. Obviously, potassium. potassium yes. This is from Mary Jo. Oh, this is a cholesterol question. This is important. What are some healthy soups for dieters with high cholesterol? Right. So first of all, you know, I hate the word diet. I heard that. Yes, I think it's completely a four-letter word, and just a mentality that you get in because I think a, a diet is essentially something you go on and then you go off. Up. It implies going off. So I think really try to think about a lifestyle. I think that just helps. That's very well. Um, and something you can live with. So in terms of answering your question, Mary Jo, um, vegetable soups are just wonderful. The more vegetables you can put in your soups and also starting a meal with a vegetable soup helps you eat less overall right. calories That's at the right. meal. Uh -huh. So it can be a real great asset. So vegetable-based soups, that have a broth base or tomato base is a definitely a great way to go. Pureeing vegetable soups to make them creamy without putting cream is a great way to go. Soup can be a great ally in a healthy soups way of eating. Are good, right? Absolutely, yeah. bean soups are fabulous. Right. Like you said, you love um, lentil soups, mm -hmm. and they can be a meal in themselves. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, Nancy wants to know how do you eat that comfort food in holiday cooking and stay on a diet. Well, instead of diet, what should we say? And not overindulge. Right, and, and exactly. How do we eat that comfort food and holiday cooking and exactly not overindulge, stay right. on track. Right, stay on track. Exactly. So you um, were saying just smaller portions and right. take a break. Okay, this is my one rule, no matter what you're eating. Okay. If it's the most indulgent thing, enjoy it. Uh -huh. Sit down and savor it. Let it register that you're eating right. it. So literally throughout the holiday season, I pick each day one thing uh -huh. that's really worth it. Right. What is that one thing that's really worth it? And I make myself a cup of tea, and I absolutely relish it. Well, that's and then good. I move on. That's right. So avoid picking, because you're going to wind up eating right. a lot of stuff that's not really even that great. Mm -hmm. And really be pick, be selective, mm -hmm. and um, and keep your portions. But modest. I like that, Nancy. That's a good idea to really savor what you're eating, so that I mean, if you're going to eat it, enjoy it, yes. and not be punishing yourself while you're eating exactly. it. Exactly. That right. only leads to <laughs> eating the rest of the tray or whatever <laughs> it is. This is from Molly. This is about a nuts allergy, and there's a lot of nut allergy. She says, when one has allergies, such as nuts, and recipes call for them, what do you substitute? Right. So it depends on the recipe, of course. A lot of times, uh, nuts are in something to give it a crunch. Uh -huh. So to give it, a, it's more of a textural thing. So first of all, a lot of people who are allergic to, say, peanuts, uh -huh. might not be allergic to tree nuts. Uh -huh. So you, if, if it calls for peanuts, you might be able to substitute something like almonds. Uh -huh. um, you might be able to substitute pumpkin seeds or... or um, or um, sunflower, sunflower seeds, seeds, for example. Yeah. So you want to find out exactly what that person's right. allergy is. Um, you can often just leave them out, or if you want something crunchy, say it's in a topping, mm -hmm. um, you can also use more like breadcrumbs sometimes. And coconut, you could use a, oh, good idea. some shaved coconut. Absolutely. I love that Ooh, on things. Absolutely, that's a good idea. Yeah, it is good. Uh, this is from Kathy. What are some easy yet healthy recipes for someone with a disability? I get very fatigued at the end of the day because I have multiple sclerosis and it's harder to stand for long. So what is a, what's a good one for uh, fatigue, I guess we're yeah. saying? Yeah, and a lot of people really find it tiring to hold a knife, to cook, to, right. to, to be standing and chopping. Right. It can uh -huh. be exhausting. But so first of all, take advantage of so many of the foods that are healthy but already prepared. So again, pre-washed greens, mm -hmm. um, already chopped garlic, mm -hmm. frozen vegetables. There's no reason not to take advantage of these. Right. They're healthful foods. Um, get yourself a little mini chopper that you just have to maybe hit That's instead, right. of, yeah. instead, instead of of cutting. It, instead of this stuff. And take advantage of your food processor. Mm -hmm. Look for recipes that you can easily you know, make in a and food processor. And get a good food processor. Exactly. <laughs> This is from Grace, 
And this is a great question. What's the best dish to bring to somebody's house over the holidays? Well, you were saying vegetables, right? Yeah, oh my gosh. My favorite thing that I make, so I'm always the one who brings the vegetables, but you don't want you them better. to be boring. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's required of me. Yes. But I don't want them to be boring. No way am I bringing a right. boring no, dish. You know, not. like someone rolls their eyes, oh, Ellie brings That's the carrots. That's what she brought. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but so what I brought um, to my mother-in-law's party, actually, last holidays, which went over great. So I make this beautiful hummus and roasted red pepper dip. And you can do any dip, you know, a healthful dip, but this is a really nice one just made with chickpeas and roasted red peppers. Anyway, all around it, I arranged it on a plate and all around it with green and red vegetables. Oh, how nice. And it just looked like this gorgeous flower. Yeah. And I will tell you, there was so much sausage and cheese out and all these other right. things. This was one of the first things to go. It was so delicious. You know, I love uh, using the green pepper as my dip rather than a cracker. Oh, yeah. That tastes so good. Endive is great yeah. and it's a little upscale. Right. So also, I do... Um, steamed, just lightly steamed green beans or uh -huh. lightly steamed asparagus is really nice for With dipping. With little almonds on it. <laughs> I like that. Okay, this is from Valerie. Okay, I'm making Thanksgiving for 10 people. I'm adamant to weigh the same the Monday after Thanksgiving as I did the week before. Any tips on helping me to accomplish this? Well, I think you kind of answered that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's we, the same. This is from Valerie. I know you're very involved with the First Lady's Let's Move campaign and making the food in public schools more healthy. What steps can a parent take to get their children healthier? Yeah, that's a big question it is. and a big important well, so one. So how, how could we start? Yeah. What's the so, first step? So I'm a mom, you know, and one of the things that I find most important is to be a role model. Mm -hmm. You can't tell your child, oh, eat these vegetables when you're sitting there eating chips. Right. So I think, first of all, eat the way you want to teach your children mm -hmm. how to eat and eat with them. So maybe we can't have meals together every single night, but as much as possible because you're not only you know, giving them more healthful food, but you're modeling a way mm. of eating, a way of behaving at the table. Right. So that's one thing. In terms of getting involved in schools, I mean, I've been involved with my daughter's public school and we've made tremendous changes. We actually are the first New York City school to win the U.S. Healthier, wow. the Healthier U.S. Schools Challenge. And what, what grades is that? And that's a pre, uh, uh, elementary school. Uh -huh. And it's, it's been um, incredible to see, you know, the changes that are made. So one of the things you can do is start a wellness committee in your school, literally just reaching out, sending out an email, mass email saying who's interested in this and starting meetings and talking together about the kinds of changes you want to make together. And our principal, our PTA president, um, the head of our school food service, we're all involved in these meetings. Oh, great. And, and it's a great way to you're, make change. Your so. kids are lucky. <laughs> this is from Gregory. Oh, Gregory, we're so glad to have a guy here today. Yeah, hi, Gregory. <laughs> His question is, is ground turkey a healthier alternative to ground beef? even if it is lean ground beef? Yeah, this is a great question because I do think it's a misconception. People think automatically if it's a turkey burger, it's a better for you than yeah. a beef burger, and it's not true. So you are correct, basically, in your assumption here. Uh -huh. um, if you get ground beef that is 90% lean or higher, you're going to be getting um, meat that's about as lean as turkey, which can be, well, turkey meat can go up to 99% lean. Uh -huh. So it depends on the turkey that you buy. Right. But sometimes you can buy turkey that has skin ground into it. Uh -huh. Or if you go to a diner or restaurant, chances are you're getting turkey that has skin ground oh, into wow. it. So it's more fatty. Yeah. So when you're cooking for yourself, choose meat, beef or turkey, that's 90% lean or higher. And that's generally what um, I do as a rule of thumb, but ground beef will have a little more saturated fat. The fat that's in right, ground beef right. will be a little more saturated than mm -hmm. turkey. But um, this is from Lois, and I I really I really want to know about this. Healthy on the go meals and snacks. I've always got my bag, things in my bag to eat later. You know, grapes, a banana, whatever I can sure. get in there. Um, Please give tips. Is there a good snack bar that isn't too many calories? Because some of those bars are 250 yeah. calories, so they're not really. Exactly. You know. Some of these bars, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, and frankly, I'm not a big, big bar person. I find I'd rat, there, a lot of them have a lot of processed ingredients. Right, right, right. So when I do look for a bar, I look for one that has about 150 calories, mm -hmm. um, not a lot of added sugar. Do you have one that you like that you, you know, can tell us? A, I like my own. <laughs> Well, you make I make them? my own, yes, really? and you can't beat them because I just use a little maple syrup, I use cinnamon, I use all kinds of nuts and dried fruit, wow. and they're not that hard to make. And you bake them? You just bake them, and then I freeze them in little individually wrapped. They're great for taking on planes and oh, stuff. So, yeah. so I do, you know, I do like Absolutely. those. Absolutely, I need them all the time. Um, Oh, this is interesting. Maureen, this is a big one, Maureen. How do you make a stuffing for people with a gluten allergy? 
I have at least half my family with these diet restrictions at my table during Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. I have the same. Uh, a number of yes. people in my family have celiac, which is a severe gluten intolerance. Well, how, how do you make a stuffing oh, without so, bread? And it's not that hard. <laughs> so um, you make you can use cornbread. You'd have to have a gluten-free cornbread. So right. you can make a cornbread stuffing because corn has no gluten, rice has no gluten, quinoa has no gluten. You can make a, so you can make cornbread stuffing. But again, you have to make sure the cornbread doesn't have any flour right. in it. You can make a stuffing with rice. You can make a stuffing with quinoa, for example. There you are. This woman knows everything. Here we go. <laughs> the answer lady. Okay. This is from David, another guy. Hi, David. Two questions for Ellie. One, which is better to cook in, cast iron or stainless steel? Okay, so it depends what you're doing. I mean, I have both. So it depends what you're doing. Cast iron is wonderful for cooking, really. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not, once it gets seasoned, a nice cast iron pot, it becomes right. like your best friend. Right. And it, it, it is like basically non-stick, uh -huh. but it can be very, very heavy. So if you're right. cooking a big amount of food and, and it's a big pot, it can be really hard to right. manage in terms mm -hmm. of cleaning it and so on. Um, so, so I think so keep one, both, and I think they're basically interchangeable. So honestly. it isn't like one holds the heat better or cooks it. Yeah, they're better different. Longer. Cast iron will take longer to heat up, right. but it'll mm -hmm. hold the heat longer. Right. And you can stick the whole thing in the oven, whereas some stainless steel pans, depending on their handle, right. you might not be able to stick it in the oven. Right, so, right. so I think have both. Honestly, um, I have I have a. Not a whole set of both, but I have right. some cast iron skillets, and I also have stainless steel. And David's second question is, is it true that cooking with aluminum pots can cause Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, you know, there was some link. I'm not sure ultimately where the research landed yeah, on this, yeah. um, but most pots are not even made with aluminum, so it's sort of a non-issue, really. Well, I'm glad that's done, David. <laughs> this is from Danielle. Do you recommend any dishes that are great as leftovers? I love leftovers. I do too. I think every, I love. Well, just, turkey's the best leftover. Oh yeah, it goes on forever. It's so true, and you do so many things. <laughs> I with know. It. Um, but yeah, in general, um, things like casseroles, right. soups, things that are good to that are that are nice to reheat are generally good leftovers. Or if you have things like salmon, you can just serve that more at room temperature the next right. day on top of a salad. Right. So you don't necessarily want to reheat proteins because they may overcook, but you can bring them to room temperature and serve them more you know, like an anti as part of an antipasta. Another question that Daniel wants to know, is the leftover meat more likely to go bad before leftover veggies? Yeah, protein foods do spoil faster than non-protein rich right. foods. But veggies so, get so sort of damp and right so it depends on the vegetable exactly yeah. so it you know you can't really keep salad it right. will just it will just right. die after a few hours right. in the refrigerator right. but um but less tender vegetables like cooked broccoli and so on right um, again i wouldn't necessarily reheat that but you may bring it to room temperature and eat it um mm -hmm. eat it cold in a salad chop right. it up and put it in a salad right. But I Anything think soups are the be. best. Yeah. Soups, chili, I love in the fall and winter. Yeah. Chili is I great. Chili. And you can keep that I love turkey in the fridge. Chili. Or stews mm. are fabulous, yeah. too. This is from Nancy. She says, they say as soon as you cut vegetables, they begin to lose their nutrients unless you freeze them. Is that true? Okay, so as soon as, yes, it is true. As soon as vegetables are cut, they begin to lose their nutrients right. because you're basically opening up the cells right. that are holding the nutrients right. in so there. How long have you got before you have to eat So it? it's not like a race to the finish <laughs> kind of thing. Like, we won't even serve on plates anymore. Um, so it's really, um, it's, not, it's pretty negligible uh -huh. with the regular cooking times right, right, and right. so on. But if you're going, I would say that if you're going to cut your vegetables, um, you shouldn't cut them like days before. Right, a lot right, of people right. will pre-cut the right. beginning of the week. You will lose some that's nutrition a, that's that good way. That's to know. And is it true that frozen vegetables are better for you than getting lettuce that's been on the shelf for a week? You know what? There's been research showing that because vegetables are frozen essentially right after being picked, right. they're comparable in nutritional value to fresh cooked um, and can often exceed the nutritional value of fresh really? cooked if, like let's say you get some carrots and they came from California, they came 3,000 miles away and they're sitting on the grocery shelf for a week and right. then they're sitting in your cupboard for right. a week and then you cook them and you keep them in your refrigerator right. for a week. By that time you're better off with the frozen. Yeah, right. So I think the point is, is that these are all frozen, fresh, fresh, there's nothing like fresh picked as close to the source right, as possible. Right, right. So that's going to be your... What does flash frozen mean? That means just immediately frozen right after being picked. I see. So the thing is these are all wonderful options for us and we should not discount any of them um, and, and take advantage. Take right. advantage of frozen, take advantage of your farmer's market of fresh food as well. 
This is from White from Cleveland. What's the healthiest way to cook your veggies? Steam, boil, or saute? I heard that boiling deteriorates the nutrients and steaming is the best. And what about sauteing? What does it do? Okay, so here's the you thing. You know every one of these things, right? <laughs> Nothing stumps you. I do. <laughs> okay. I've been studying for answer years. Answer lady, answer lady. Okay. So, so Steam, I, boil, or sauteing? Yeah, this is a really good one because it's key to know that nutrients, there are many nutrients that are soluble in water. Uh -huh. So that means they leach into any kind of water right. that you cook them in. So the less water you use in cooking, the less you lose vitamins. Right. So you know when you cook your broccoli or something and, and you boil it and then you pour out the water and it's kind of green? Right. Those are the nutrients <laughs> right. right there. Bye. Yeah, bye bye down the drain. <laughs> so if you're going to eat that in a soup, that's fine. Right. But um, so the best way is steaming, steaming because you're having very little content right. with con you're having very little contact when you steam, you're having very little contact with the water. Right. Um, sauteing also is no water, right? So right. you're just using some fat there. And actually, um, and that's a quick cooking method, which also is beneficial. So you're going to preserve a lot of nutrients that way. And here's a really interesting fact, is that when you eat your vegetables with a little bit of fat, a little bit of oil, as in sauteing, you actually absorb the fat-soluble nutrients better. Ah. So, steaming and using a little bit of olive oil right. and herbs maybe to make right. it tasty also helps you nutritionally. Or sauteing in a little bit of oil. I'm starving talking <laughs> to you. Starving. So this is from Trisha. What's an alternative to turkey on Thanksgiving that's not that hard to make for vegetarians? Oh my gosh. Okay, so <laughs> I know it's hard because it's so centered around this turkey. <laughs> I know. And that tofurkey thing, no, that's no, not for me. That, you know no. what, I, I personally, I have a lot of vegetarian friends and I love eating veg right. vegetarian style. Right. And I think what really what Thanksgiving is, is a celebration of the harvest. And so make vegetarian food that celebrates all of the seasonal yeah. vegetables. Squashes. I, squashes. Things. I have this um, autumn vegetable curry that I love that would be just beautiful Great. as a centerpiece oh, for Thanksgiving. And so it doesn't have to be a turkey or resemble a turkey yeah, yeah, or be no. shaped like a turkey yeah. in any way. No, um, take the tofu some, and make the <laughs> Just something hearty that celebrates all all the seasonal vegetables I think will be a huge winner. This is from Lorraine. Every time I prepare a turkey, it's too dry. What am I doing wrong? Are there tips for keeping it moist? Yeah, well, this is the, always the trouble with roasting a whole bird. If it's chicken or a turkey, right. the breast cooks before the leg. Right. So the key is to really protect the breast by, so by you can cover it with foil uh -huh. for a good part of the cooking uh -huh. before, and then when the then take the foil off or cover it in the mid cooking so that it it slows the cooking of the breast I see. so that the leg can get done because uh -huh. the leg's not gonna most of well, those. That's a great tip. I know. didn't know that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now uh, there's another question I really want to get to. It's wonderful. Where is it now? Um, Oh, uh, this is Ro Roland. Are probiotics like yogurt really good for your digestive system? And what do you recommend for digestion? I have these issues. Oh, I'm sorry you have these issues. So do I. <laughs> That's no fun. <laughs> um, but yes, probiotics, which are in, you know, th those are the active cultures that are in yogurt. Right. Um, those are great for your digestion. And not only that, it's pretty amazing because, you know, our digestive tracts affect our overall health and uh -huh. our immune system. So right. having a healthy sort of good bacteria in your digestive tract right. keeps your immune system up too and helps right. you fight disease in general. Um, and besides that, for digestion, um, making sure you eat enough fiber. Mm -hmm. So foods that are rich in fiber like um, berries, fruits, whole fruits and vegetables essentially, whole grains, beans. Right. Um, getting those probiotics is great. Granola, um, right? Yeah, granola mm -hmm. because that's from oats, you know, right. rich in oats. Oh, and then actually nuts, like right. you say, because I'm a big fan of nuts, absolutely. Right. Um, and then drinking enough water. I think that's a, often a missing link for people. Yeah. They don't realize they're not well hydrated. They're too dehydrated, yes. Yeah, and you can't really have a good digestive system unless water can flush it out. Uh, this is from Georgina. Does the time of day you eat matter? I've heard eating at night is not good, but other people say that it's not about the time of day, it's about the amount of calories consumed. What's the truth? Yeah. And then see, and then Shanna comes back, but there's kind of two questions in one. Shanna says, I've heard your biggest meal should be breakfast and dinner should be the lightest meal. Is that true? Yeah. So, so, so this is unfortunately, so first of all, your body doesn't know when it's eating a calorie. A calorie basically is a calorie in your body. But that said, you want to really get most of your calories when you need them for, for, for your brain energy and to be activity, active in yeah. the day. And what happens is most people do not do that. Most people really do not eat much all day, and they go home and they don't stop eating. Right. So this is a problem, and that's why it helps a lot of people if they stop eating at night. 
So I say, and it just helps because that's a time where people tend to overeat. Mm -hmm. So I say absolutely, eat more you know, of a plentiful breakfast and a plentiful lunch and keep your dinner modest mm -hmm. and then pick a cutoff time because I think a lot of people get into this munch fest at night right, right. where it doesn't stop. <laughs> right. And so literally, I think it really helps to pick a cutoff time that works for you. After that, no more food. Done. Right. And Done. this way you'll be hungry for breakfast when you wake up That's in the morning. That's right. I know we're running out of time, but there's a couple of questions I want you to answer. This is from Dave. Which foods have the right amount of omega-3 fatty acids? And what do they do that's so good for you? That's a very good yeah, question. Yeah, and you hear this all the time know, now right. in the news, omega-3, what, right, right. what is that what is anyway? That? So these are fats that essentially are the best fats for your body. They, are, they're, they have an antioxidant-like you know, um, healing property to them, and they also reduce inflammation in the body. So it's very important to get enough omega-3s. Here's the great news, is that one um, serving of salmon essentially gives you like a day's worth of really? omega threes. So including foods like salmon or other fish that are high in fat, so sardines, mm -hmm. or really most fish in general. So eating fish at least twice a week and trying to eat higher um, fat fish And like anything that. other than fish? Do, yeah. do nuts have it? Yeah, so um, walnuts have uh -huh. omega threes, mm -hmm. um, flax has omega three. Right. Um, but it's a little bit of a different kind. So the kind you get in fish is actually really superior to mm -hmm. other kinds, but um, so that's really the key way to get your omega-3. This is from Detroit Hottie. Hi, Detroit Hottie. Hottie. Is it better to have your protein before a workout or after your My workout? My husband calls Detroit Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> He's from Michigan, that's so funny. I'm like a little Michigander in a way. <laughs> um, so you know what? You want to eat, so when, you, when you're replenishing after your workout, you want to definitely include some protein because it helps your body absorb the carbohydrates. You mm -hmm. want to combine some carbohydrate and some protein. You can have some protein as well before your workout if you digest it well. And everyone's digestive systems are different. Personally, I can't eat much more than toast prior to a workout. Right. Uh -huh. So I think it really depends. If you can handle a little protein, great. But it's more important, I think, to eat it r right after for replenishment. Okay, uh, we're going to have to stop soon. But Peter wants to know, What's the best and safest way to lose weight? Are there three tips for losing and maintaining weight, please? And Peter, I love that so you please. included the word maintaining in there. That's so right. right away you have the right attitude. So I'm very impressed by that. Because it's not just about losing it. We can, anyone could kind of lose right. weight. It's about keeping it off and making it part of your life. So three tips. I would say, first of all, eat mostly, eat more vegetables. Fill your plate. Half your plate should be vegetables at lunch and dinner, and mm -hmm. your snacks as well should include some kind of vegetables. That's really gonna help you a lot. Secondly, don't drink your calories, mm -hmm. okay? Really important, drink water, drink non-caloric beverages, mm -hmm. except maybe a little wine, which right. I always have to make an allowance <laughs> That's for. That's right. Um, and then be active. Being active is such a critical part of it. Do something active every day. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be 90 minute intense workout, right. but do something active that raises your heart rate, that gets your blood going, that makes you sweat a little every mm -hmm. day. Well, we're out of time. You've just great. We're just oh, loving having This has been so it. much fun. You're so good. Thank you. So many. And we have way more questions, but that's all we have time for. So thank you for being thank here. You. Please come back. I would love to. It's so, a real pleasure. So save your questions for her. She'll be back. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.